series of interviews with distinguished Scottish women artists called Scottish Women Can Paint came about as a repost to a comment made by the German artist George Banzelitz when he said, when asked uh, why women were so underrepresented in museums and commercial galleries, he said, women can't paint. This series of interviews with seven prominent Scottish women artists sets out to disprove that belief and try to understand how, against incredible odds, a group of dedicated women painters have managed to create some of the best paintings produced in Scotland and abroad during the last half of the 20th century. Today, I'm talking to my old friend Joyce Cairns, first woman president of the Royal Scottish Academy, um, one of Scotland's most prominent figurative painters. Joyce, it's a delight to be here with you in your studio. Um, I'm going to ask you a couple of uh, simple questions about your background and uh, training. But first of all, uh, I wonder if in your ear shot, Baselitz had said, women can't paint, what would have been your reply to him? <laughs> I've no idea, we just treat it with the contempt that it deserves, <laughs> I reckon. Uh, well, I, he was always someone who was looking for publicity. And mm -hmm. indeed, he it seems he said uh, a few years before that, East German painters, uh, East German artists can't paint. So, and got a lot of publicity for it. Mm. So, first of all, Joyce, you were born in Edinburgh in 1947. I was actually born in Haddington, though we lived in Edinburgh, and I was born in the Vert Memorial Hospital, where William Gillis was also born. So that's my claim to fame. <laughs> Artistic fame. Well, that was the other question I can ask that. Was there, apart from being born in the same hospital as Gillies, was there any art in your family background? Well, I had um, an uncle, uh, and, and a, an, an aunt who both were amateur painters. Uh, the uncle shot himself in 1933 uh, because he was meant to take over the farm and couldn't face it. And my auntie Nancy did sort of uh, big, uh, quite exuberant flower paintings. And I think one of her tutors on one of these um, kind of amateur classes was Elizabeth Blackadder. And actually, when you look, I don't have any of them, but when you look back on them now, we all thought they were awful, but actually they were really quite <laughs> quite joyful. <laughs> so it's a shame, but she didn't, wouldn't have had that opportunity to go to art school, as neither did her brother, George. Well, was there anyone outside your family who encouraged you to go to art school? Um, no, not really. I That came from myself. I always, you know, I, yeah, I think when I was... At school, my painting of a circus was put up on the wall in primary school in Juniper mm -hmm. Green. And I thought, oh, I'm good at something. I got my picture on the wall. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I was much good at anything else. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, when I was at school in Edinburgh, there was no encouragement in the school. And um, so I went into, well, my family wanted me to do a proper job. So I went into nursing for a year at the Western General. And my brother took all my uh, stuff that I'd done at school to his art master and he said oh she's got to go to art school he mounted them all made a beautiful portfolio and so I went to art school oh so it was outside help yes it was and I, mean, I mean yeah uh, it was good I mean they were obviously quite a progressive art department mm. because my brother used to bring home studio internationals mm. and studio magazine mm. so yeah it was interesting of course once you got to art school all of this you know Hockney etc mm. etc there was no mention of that, you know, you're back to Villard and Bonnard, you know, they didn't look good. We didn't get much art history at Well, all. it was still like that in my time yeah, in Edinburgh. Yeah. But, but um, if you had continued the nursing, do you think you would have never painted again? I don't know. I, I mean, I wanted to go to, I mean, I, the nursing, you know, whilst it was, you know, very good learning experience. I mean, I'd been at a girls' school, and of course, being in nursing was like still being in a boarding school because mm. you were locked in at 10 o'clock mm. so no dashing medical students could get hold mm. of you. <laughs> and, uh, but no, I, I, mean, I dreamed I dreamed of being at art school all that year. Um, uh, yeah. Well, Marina Branovich said, you can't become an artist, you're either born an artist 
or not. Mm -hmm. Do you agree with that? Yes, I've I right from as far as I can remember, I scribbled and drew over everything, um, and that's when I was happiest. Sometimes, you know, it would probably been a release when difficult times at home, mm. etc. But yeah, it, it was just mm. part of me, really. Yes, I mean we can talk about that a bit later in some of your paintings because mm. you did have a troubled childhood with a, a, an unstable mother. Mm -hmm. um, has that brought a dark quality to your paintings, do you think? Oh, very much so. And I mean, obviously, any family who'd been through the war, um, the effects of war mm. uh, throughout all families who um, you know, went through it, you know, had after effects that mm. actually still continue to this generation. You know, while well, mm. well, we're still alive, it affects each one mm -hmm. in different ways. Is that one of the reasons why you did your very big ambitious war tourist series to kind of work some of those things out? Um, I think it started, I had a fascination uh, once I'd been given, you know, my after my mother died, um, I felt I could open the Pandora's box. There was a lot of things that you couldn't paint about when she was alive. Mm. And also my brother gave me my father's suitcase, which was full of his memorabilia. So I started sorting it out, you know, and I got his grapefruit and his mm -hmm. kilt and his, all these medals and various things. So I was totally fascinated and I thought, what a shame that I never asked him about the war when he was alive, you know, because he died. Mm of prostate cancer, probably about 60, age 63 or 64. Mm -hmm. And um, the war obviously affected him, uh, you know, as it did many men. They were never happier than they would leave the house probably about half seven, go down to the golf club or whatever, and be with people who'd experienced the same things as they had. Mm -hmm. And I mean, sometimes, you know, he would have troubled moments because he'd been, you know, probably post-traumatic stress, mm -hmm. I would say. Mm -hmm. But he was very funny, I mean, mm. but he was a very much a disciplinarian where, you know, there was no way you would, could go out of line. Um, you know, he would call the police if you weren't back home by a certain time. <laughs> he obviously knew young men too well from yeah. the, the war. But your mother was, and I, and I think you're not afraid to talk about this because you paint about it. Yeah. I, well, I, she was very sensitive. She really was. I mean, she was a very gifted pianist. But again, you know, she didn't get that mm. opportunity. You know, she had to look after her, her mother mm. who'd got breast mm. cancer, you know, and help on the farm, mm. etc. Um, so, so really she never had any kind of major job, I don't think, mm -hmm. but, you know, when she played the piano, she lost in it, but yes, I, th I think the war affected her greatly, you know, all these l six years and three little children, not me, I wasn't born then, mm -hmm. um, up in Codder and, mm -hmm. you know, t being told to pack a pram with everything you needed and go into the woods if mm -hmm. the Germans invaded. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think she maybe also suffered from probably, um, what you call it, uh, after the birth of a ch children that she, that affected her quite a lot. Mm. Postnatal. Yeah, postnatal depression, that's yeah. the word I'm looking for. And I can remember that she wasn't well, um, I think before she actually uh, tried to commit suicide. I, um, I can remember that she was lying in, in the room next to me and I think father got a dog to try and cheer her up. But then one day I think she just locked herself in the bathroom. We were only, I think Robert, we, my brother would have been about seven, eight, no, eight and I might have been nine. You know, mm. I, I don't know what age, we were mm. young and um, it was quite a dramatic thing because to do that was a, a crime in those days. Mm and it involved the police and the ambulance. And I remember we were locked in the dining room, but I remember looking over the windowsill and um, she was covered in a red blanket, you know, and a, it was, yeah, and it was, it, it probably, you, you laid it to rest, but we didn't really see her. She was locked up in Craig House, you know, which is where Siegfried Sassoon was in yeah. the war. And we would be, you know, sometimes we'd be in the car and she would wave to you behind barred win windows. Mm. And also she was given that very primitive electric treatment, which I think was devastating for people. Mm. Um, yeah, so, we, you know, she might get home and then she'd be back in again mm. because she just wasn't mm. well enough. And it is a kind of element that goes through your paintings. When I had yeah. that marvellous exhibition of your, your works in 369 Gallery in 86, 87, there is that picture which I think we've got a photograph behind her of, mm -hmm. uh, which you said is, is now in a museum in Canada, where she is in fact 
slitting her wrists in, in the painting? No, it's in this one here. Ah, ah no. no. Oh, yes, yes, it is. Yes, that's right. Sorry, I beg mm. your pardon. It's mm. on the, yes, it's, oh, um, they said the war was partly to blame, yeah, that painting. painting yeah, which yeah. was a very moving painting. I've always mm -hmm. been moved by it. But yeah. I've just noticed, as I said, in this one here, that there she is, she's got a razor blade in her hand mm -hmm. and she's yeah. dripping blood. And then yeah. sometimes I use the symbol of the hen as mother, you know, and ah. I've used it kind of, you know, kind of, um, they can't mm. do anything to mm. help themselves, you know, mm. or they're caged in that uh, mm. sort of time mm. that yeah. they couldn't get over. I mean, she eventually recovered, but mm. You know, she would probably she had lots mm. of memory gaps, and that mm. would have been the electric mm. treatment. I mean, this is a painting about your childhood, isn't it, really? Yes, it is, and that's actually the myself and the little the blue dress is in a school photograph at Juniper Green Primary. Mm -hmm. um, so it was I remember it well. You know, it's pale blue with that little crocheting on it, mm. and. Um, it's also, it was a painting about the death of my eldest sister in 2010 and mm. also uh, the big beloved cat who was nearly died but didn't. So yeah. it was most of, all of them. But it also the, the, the main thing was the book, the, the Magic Gate, and that's what inspired the painting, which was a book that mother used to, when we were little, read to my little brother and myself under the bedclothes mm. in her petticoat which yeah. is what she's in oh, there. Yeah. And that book went, it was terrifying because it was all about the things that would happen to you if you were naughty. Um, and I think the illustration on it is a boy being bound up in spider's yeah. webs because he'd been naughty <laughs> <laughs> with, with, the, <laughs> with a pixie. Yes. And the, the Easter card was one I gave to my mother. Mm. I, I keep things, you know, mm. and I found that in her effects when she died. And also there's a, a bag from Cyprus in the far corner. Mm. My eldest brother, the one who's um, rowing the, the boat, boat. Um, he was, um, when he did his national service, he was out in Cyprus during the Aoka, mm. I think, uh, troubles. Mm. So he brought that little bag back to me from Cyprus. And I like to put in things, you know, like the spangles. I, I look for artefacts that are relevant to the time and mm. all my paintings, you know, and especially in the war paintings. Mm. Um, you, you know, everywhere yeah. I go, I visit mm -hmm. museums and I bring back these objects which are now treasured, which mm. some of them are really terrifying things and put them back mm -hmm. into people's memory by putting them into the paintings. So it's, I was never in the war, you know, so you link to, or I link to different time periods mm. in a painting be through the mm. artefacts. And that is what you do, of course, your paintings skip through time as well, don't yes, they? Yes, they do, they yeah. From yeah. the past to the present. Yeah, day. yeah. And, you know, to, to construct them, then, you know, that you know, you asked me earlier about, um, do you square everything up? And I say, yes, I, I mm. do, I have to, because they're so complicated. Mm -hmm. But it's only the skeleton design, and then everything else comes mm. in. I, you know, I find things if I'm missing mm. something, and I look for things, and I'll think, oh, that's interesting, I'm good to put that in the mm -hmm. painting. Um, mm. You know, there's a bowl there, which we called Auntie Minus Bowl, um, and again, that's a kind of family artefact. But can I get away now from your early family to art school, which you had desperately wanted to go to, and you got to art school. Which art school did you go to, and when? Well, I went to... Um, Grey School of Art because my sister was in Aberdeen and I thought well I don't want to go to Edinburgh because um, my father would be horrified at things I might get up to. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's just as well I didn't, mm. you know, after reading mm. Helen Bellany's book about, you know, her life mm. in Rose mm. Street mm. You know, and her wonderful um, autobiography. Um, no, I don't think my father, I probably would have been quite wild if I'd had mm. that opportunity. <laughs> Were you wild in Aberdeen? Not n initially. I was, um, I think when I went for the, uh, you know, for the Freshers' Day, Ian Fleming mm. uh, looked at me. I had a grey suit on, you know, it was very trendy, I thought, mm. from CNAs. Mm -hmm. And he said, are you for the door school? <laughs> because nobody else was in a suit. It's just I didn't know any better, but mm -hmm. it didn't take long before the purple tights came on. <laughs> uh, but I think in many ways, it was an excellent education that I had in Greece. Mm -hmm. um, you, you know, the, we weren't left our own devices. It was like mm -hmm. the course hadn't changed since probably 1984, mm -hmm. in that you got antique painting, antique drawing, um, you can't imagine, you know, we, we, we had to cut up a huge um, eight by four piece of hardboard when we arrived and we had all different shapes and there was four little shapes 
wonder no, no, what these are for. Well, we soon found out we had to paint an ear, an eye, a nose and a mouth. And in sculpture, we modelled an ear, mm -hmm. an eye, an, mm -hmm. you know, from the mm -hmm. antique cast. Mm -hmm. And then when you'd done that, you got to paint a full head. <laughs> so, I mean, can you imagine putting, giving people to do that mm -hmm. now? They wouldn't think. And the day was organised into still life, um, you know, um, have draped life drawing, composition. I think you got a whole day for composition. Mm -hmm. Um, life drawing and uh, you didn't get life painting in the first or second year because it was a general course so mm. we also did the design course alongside mm. half the time. It sounds as though you actually really enjoyed art college. Oh I did yes I did I think no I, I think as I got up the school you know when people you know the staff started to take mm. notice of me and I was sent to hospital field in my third year mm. um, then some of the, the male students got a bit resentful I think you know they weren't always kind I don't well, think. I was going to ask you that mm -hmm. I ask other people how were you perceived and treated by the male tutors and other male contemporary students? Well by the male tutors you were treated just the same as everyone mm -hmm. else I can remember when in the first year when Colin Toms got us for composition mm -hmm. and he looked around all of us and he said I wonder if there's a Joan Eardley or an Anne Redpath in here. And then he sneered at us all and said, I don't think so. <laughs> I wouldn't be so lucky. <laughs> I can't believe that Colin Toms taught you because I knew him. As, oh, as really? Well. Yes. yes. Was, I yeah. knew his son very well. But yeah. what about inspirational women teachers? Were there any women tutors? Yes. Well, I think um, Grace was actually had Frances Walker, who had been yeah. on the staff. Now, Dundee had no female tutors because I remember once I was on the staff in Aberdeen uh, going down to Dundee to do a tutorial day mm -hmm. and there wasn't a single the woman, I never had a female member of staff mm -hmm. and while I was in my third year uh, Sylvia Wishart joined the staff so we had two female mm -hmm. members of staff in painting which was quite extraordinary. Mm -hmm. and, well, yeah. well in Edinburgh in my time in the 70s in a painting staff of many more than 12 men, we only had two uh, female tutors. So it, it hadn't changed very no, much, no, really. Yeah. Um, would, um, did you think that, you put on to it a little bit, that the other male students resented your success and felt that a woman didn't deserve to have such a career as men? I don't know if they didn't think, they would have thought that they didn't deserve to have such a career as men. I think it was just petty jealousy, mm. you know, really, and maybe mm. it wouldn't matter who was uh, mm. top, you know. I think I had a rival uh, for top position with Stuart MacDonald, you know, who's mm. the late Stuart MacDonald, who ran the lighthouse, you remember? Yes. Yeah. Mm. Um, so, and okay, I think in the third year, you know, you're quite vying to see who would be top of drawing and whatnot, mm. etc. But, um, yeah, no, no, but there were others who were not really very pleasant, mm -hmm. as I remember. So I can remember, mm -hmm. you know, thinking, having yeah. a few tears from time yeah. to time. Really? But no, the male staff didn't really treat you badly, mm -hmm. I don't think. I mean, they treated everybody, or one or two of them treated everybody, um, none of us, very well. <laughs> that <laughs> you know, was true of Edinburgh, too. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, it was equal. <laughs> yes, yes. And I mean, I think all the time I was there, nobody ever actually said to me, what are you painting about, Joyce? What is this about? Mm. It was all about, oh, change that tone, sharpen that line, or, mm. um, you know, that's um, mm. just mm. varying mm. things about the practicalities. Mm. But, you know, mm. I, I think perhaps if I'd had too much freedom early on, I wouldn't have mm. been able to get the skills that I, mm. uh, you know, have and mm. uh, your ability to look at things. I mean I've spoken to many of your students, former students, who said you were an inspirational teacher. Um, oh, were nice. there, what, were there any, the female tutors there, did they take a particular interest in you? Was there an inspirational female tutor there? Oh, uh, you know, well I mean when Sylvia uh, came to um, Grey's and I think it was 1969 in my third year and um, she had us for drawing and thought, oh, we're all out to press and you lady mm. tutor how fantastic we're all so excited mm. and um, you know, I think I put everything but the kitchen sink into this drawing and she came along and looked at it and she said in her very lovely Orkney voice she said hmm she said 
and I think we could just do a bit more selection, you know, less is more. And she took a putty rubber and she just dabbed out some things. And do you know, it was a revelation. I mean, just what she mm. did, mm. I think, opened up a whole thing. You mm. see, I don't remember, I don't know if I'd had Francis as a tutor mm. for some reason, because there were quite few tutors. Um, I maybe missed out on Francis, mm. though, I mean, obviously, I knew of her. I would think I might have had her for life painting mm -hmm. for a bit in the fourth year. Um, that's what I remember. But I never had her for composition or still life or anything like that. Just missed it. But I did have Sylvia. What was your ambition to do after art college? Many people thought the only thing you could do was teach uh, in a school, mm -hmm. let alone in an art college. But you went on to do further study, didn't you? Yes, well, I think, I mean, I, I, I don't think I thought about it until I was at a party in some posh residence in Queen's Road and there was three of the postgrad students there, one being Alan Robb. I think, I don't know what year I would have been, third year maybe. Mm. And uh, they were talking about, they were applying to the Royal College and I must have said, oh, what's that? And they explained, mm. and I said, oh, that's where I want to go. And they said, oh, you've got high ambitions, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> and so I had that flame in my mind, and mm. um, yeah, so I, I, that's what I did. And um, after in postgrad, I applied to go to mm. um, the Royal College. Mm -hmm. But I mean, in the in the uh, I won the I think there was a student competition, and in those days um, you worked to Edinburgh and you worked for a week in Edinburgh College of Art during the Easter holidays, mm. and there was twelve students, three from each art school, mm. and you'd had to send I think some work down before you were selected to do it. And, you know, synchronise your brushes at nine o'clock, mm. etc. Mm. And we also had a meal in the Royal Scottish Academy mm. with Philipson and some mm. of the council. Mm. I mean, and that was amazing to us, mm. you know, to do that. And, um, and I've never forgotten that. Anyway, I won what was the main prize then, which was a Carnegie Travelling Scholarship, uh, which I used to go off to Italy and travel around there. So that gave me ambition as well, yeah. you know, because I think if you get recognition, you know, and I was yeah. kind of getting a bit of recognition, you know, you won this, the hospital field gave me recognition. Yeah. I think these things help to give you um, mm -hmm. a Philip on the way, mm -hmm. and I think that's why it's, it's so important that mm -hmm. all the things that we do mm -hmm. in the academy to support young people through the Kinross Travelling Scholarships, the con New Contemporaries, and all various other mm -hmm. things that we do, do help people to have, um, I think, I can do this, you know, I've been rewarded, mm -hmm. and if you're not rewarded, it's quite difficult, I think, for some artists, and that's maybe why people stop doing it. Well, I think that is true. I mean, I mean, a lot of people would say, you know, you're having to fight against obstacles that male artists don't have to mm -hmm, fight yeah. against. Yeah. Um, and in some ways, that's one of the things which I think has made the female painters I've been talking about so interesting mm -hmm. because they've overcome those obstacles oh, yeah. and in their paintings you can see the sight of victory almost won which mm -hmm. I find very exciting yeah. where a lot of the male painters are a little bit more blasé mm -hmm. about things but uh, did you find the Royal College and London to be vastly different from Aberdeen? Very very I loved it though mm -hmm. I loved every moment of it um, and I was living in um, Shepherd's Bush and but then travelling through Holland Park, you know, mm. but so the kind of con what I, w I was most aware of is, was the contrast between those who have and mm. those who don't, mm. and I I found that really very disturbing mm. in that first year, mm. um, you know, sitting on the number twelve bus trotting along, you know, going to mm. Exhibition Road, uh, mm. but yeah, it was it, it, I was so bombarded with things to look at, you know, I loved sitting on the bus. Mm looking at everything. I still do. Um, uh, it was an amazing experience and also I think to be working with people from different art schools from all mm. over the country, mm. um, you know, getting different viewpoints. You know, I, I could never have gone back to Aberdeen to Grace to teach if I hadn't had that experience, yeah, really. That's a, that's a question I've also asked lots of people. Do you think you need to get out of Scotland as an artist for a bit to be able to go back and, and actually work there. I definitely think that was the case then. I'm not so sure now. It definitely mm. was the case. You needed to widen your experience. Mm -hmm. And if you think there wasn't there wasn't a lot for artists, um, you know, to 
do. I mean, you would have mm -hmm. the Scottish Gallery in Edinburgh. Mm -hmm. um, I think Douglas and Fowlis. Mm -hmm. um, there was no small galleries mm -hmm. in Aberdeen that I remember. Mm -hmm. You had the wonderful Aberdeen Art Gallery, mm -hmm. of course, with its magnificent collection. Um, so to have that experience, to widen your horizons, I think is very important. Yes, I remember there were only in the 70s about half a dozen commercial galleries in the yeah. whole of Scotland. Yeah. Yet Amsterdam, uh, a town the size of Edinburgh, had something like a hundred commercial yeah. galleries. Yeah. I mean, it was a, it, it was a very different life to now. Yeah. yeah, and I mean to work in London and to be absolutely next door with a private back stairs into the V&A, you know. Yeah. And of course your work changed, it maybe didn't do it for the better some points because there were so much, many more influences coming in mm. and into your mind that you wanted to look at. Mm. But in, in terms of an experience, I would never have um, mm. you know, missed it for the world. And to meet you know, people like Carol Waite and whatnot, mm. uh, they were a different kind of breed. Mm. You know, I think we disgraced ourselves, the three Scottish students in my first year, they had a sherry party I think in the first week. <laughs> <laughs> one of them got grabbed a whole bottle of sherry, so behind the chaise long we consumed this <laughs> out of lead legless. <laughs> so typical Keep, Scots. Keeping up a good <laughs> Scottish <laughs> tradition. <laughs> uh, That's right. um, after college, um, what was your first exhibition post art college? Uh, post arts college? Oh my goodness me. Well, I was a student for 10 years because after the mm. Royal College I went to Cheltenham and was on a fellowship. Goodness, I had forgotten about that. Yeah, yeah. so I had a year there where I was doing a bit of teaching mm. in the art school and the studios mm. were in Stroud in a mm -hmm. big Victorian mm. museum building with mm. turrets and things. Mm -hmm. And of course you, each of these stages you had a show at mm -hmm. the end of it. Mm. And then um, after that I went back to London and I did a year at Goldsmiths doing teacher training. Mm. And then I got the job in Aberdeen. So, so, so had you decided that your way forward was to teach by that time? Well, yes. You know, I mean, it, 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 you know, what else were you going to do, really? Mm. Um, you know, I'd supported myself through doing all sorts of different jobs through the Royal College, from mm. early morning cleaning to betting shops to, you name it, I did it. And um, I remember you said at one point you were a chambermaid in the Tontine Hotel. In, oh yes, well that was earlier. Google. That so, was when I was in um, uh, at Greece. I was yeah. a chambermaid. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and, you know, I also um, was a waitress in Crawford's, mm -hmm. just uh, where the North British Hotel is, and there used to be mm -hmm. a Crawford's there. Yeah. How do I remember that? <laughs> I have a lot of different transferable skills. <laughs> I've forgotten that would be very useful <laughs> if I yeah. need them. Yeah. Um, but no, the first, I think my, I had an exhibition, the first one I think was in the, it was either the, the Compass, they always gave oh, yeah. you the first, and then mm. the English Speaking Union. Oh, yes. But these exhibitions, um, they, they, they were a mixture of all sorts of things. And I think the first adult exhibition I had was an art space in Aberdeen, Peacock, mm. um, and that was in 1984. And that was the first, I think, serious that... body of work. Mm. And that was about my mother's death. Yeah. and. Um, it was a sort of grains of th yeah. also thinking about the war and yeah. really whatnot. that's when I first you, yeah the, your strength and importance came to my attention at yeah. that time I saw yeah. that exhibition yeah. and then that's when we discussed having an exhibition with me in Edinburgh of yeah, course which that's we did right. two years later and I came yeah. to visit you in, in and the work changed quite yeah. a lot between that 84 yeah. exhibition and became more colorful and um, I suppose uh, sharper and not yeah. so dreamy and um, out of focusy type mm. things. Yeah, I mean they were very powerful. You were a very powerful narrative painter. Yeah. And that's a strong tradition in mm -hmm. British art. Yeah. I think it takes a while, you know, when you went to art school in those days, it's not, you, you know, you didn't expect to be anything for 10 years mm. after art school. Mm. Whereas now I think you want to be, you know, I mean after, you know, the, the uh, emergence of the guys from Glasgow, mm -hmm. you know, Campbell, etc., mm -hmm. etc. I really thought, mm -hmm. oh, well, you know, the way ahead is just out of mm -hmm. art school, but it, mm -hmm. it didn't, that wasn't really for me. Mm -hmm. you know. Was there an audience for your kind of work at the beginning of your career in the 80s, the beginning of your exhibiting career? And has that changed over the years? Ah, uh, 
Well, I think I'm an acquired taste, Andrew. <laughs> they're not exactly cheery, and they're very big. <laughs> oh, I acquired people, early. Yes, yes, it seems to be very interesting people who buy my paintings, I always find. You know, mm. Yes, I don't, you know, I don't, I mean, I, I think I had amazing high spots when I did the War Tourist Show, yeah. extraordinary, but um, I've never really set out to be commercial or, 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 mm -hmm. or with that in mind. I have to do the paintings because I want to do them. Yeah, that's clear. And um, whether they sell or not, I mean, if you want to be sell, you wouldn't be doing them that scale, would you, or bigger. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's where I get the most satisfaction. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I, I feel complete when I've done one of those, you know, and I want to go back into it. And I, I do small things, obviously, mm -hmm. but I don't get the same Mm -hmm. sort of buzz from well, it. I want to talk about your practice in a moment but before that I was going to ask you then how do you throughout your career how have you defined success? Oh, I know, that's a difficult one it's not through sales of paintings mm -hmm. I think throughout my career I think when I got the job in um, you know when I got into the Royal College I was and, and hospital mm -hmm. field to the me post -graduate. Was, well, not I was postgraduate school no that was, that was, was the third school. year yes a yes. summer school to be selected for that, yeah. and and that was a huge influence was, on me. Was it's it one from each art college? Who three, went? three from each That's art college. Right. Oh, there were twelve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And on that was mm. Glenn Onwin. He mm. was there mm. uh, on that same lot. Mm. But they were Edinburgh were vastly sophisticated to me at that yeah. time. I was saying that to him uh, the other day. I said, you know, you were out in, in, on a boat going into the caves, recording the sound of the sea in the caves, etc. You know, mm. <laughs> for me, it was the first bit of freedom I'd had to do whatever I wanted. Yeah. The tutor in charge was Jack Knox. Yeah. There was nobody leaning over your sort. I did a whole lot of range of yeah. finding myself in yeah. experimental ways of working. Yeah. Um, and that, that was wonderful to me. And um, then the next thing I think was probably winning the Carnegie um, scholarship, mm -hmm. going to Italy and getting into the Royal College mm -hmm. was, I was thrilled to bits because I was only like the, the second person who'd gone mm. from Aberdeen to the Royal mm. College and um, and then I suppose getting the job in Aberdeen mm. you know to come back and uh, teach in the art school. But further than that I'm just going to say you mentioned how impressed you were by that lunch with Robert and Philipson and the Royal Academicians all mm. those years ago as a student was did you have an ambition ever in your mind to become president of the Royal Scottish Academy, let alone the yeah. first woman president? I, well, I actually used to go into the academy when I was at school and I saw the mm. f first big exhibition of Modigliani Soutine in yeah. there. And I'd obviously, I would spend my pocket money and go and see the RSA, you know, a mm. couple of years uh, before I left school. And no, I never thought that I would ever end up being in that position, you know, and, and you know, it was. A, I can remember the Philipsons, a big whole, and the big gallery too, filling a whole wall. And I thought they were wonderful. Mm. And I got through my O level English and my higher English by writing visit to an exhibition on the Modigliani Soutine. Mm. I just switch, I managed to manipulate the questions yes. and <laughs> write about it each time. Mm. Um, but no, I, I, um, I suppose, and because as we said before, what galleries were there that you could show in? I mean, mm. the Scottish Gallery weren't going to look at you. Mm. But I think I got my first painting into the Academy in 1970, my fourth, a fourth year mm. painting. Mm. And I got written about by Edward Gage. Mm. And it wasn't for sale because the college had already said they wanted to keep it for the collection. Mm. And I can remember, I think the comment was something, what a shame, you know, why it wasn't for sale kind of thing. Mm. And, um, so yes, I've, and then I would try to put work into the annual exhibition, even from London. So I had that th thing, you know, and winning mm. an award. So it's that generational mm. thing that the Academy has, mm. that you get, you know, you get hooked on young and mm. you just keep on so going. So do you think, in a way, you're... But I never imagined I'd even be a member of the Academy. It would never have occurred to me. I wouldn't mm. have known about presidents in those mm -hmm. days. It would never have occurred to me how well, it worked. Anne Redpath was the first woman painter academician in 1952 I think so it's come a long way it since certainly then. has yeah no but there were uh, there was a Scott Mary um, Phyllis Bowen wasn't it she was a sculptor yeah, yes that's right she was she used before, before. Yeah. yeah but no I mean um, as, as you know Alice will probably talk about that at the mm. uh, thing that we were doing in the Discussion, borders yeah. yeah yeah so 
in a way then is it almost a duty for you to give back having had so much encouragement from it? Oh yes, I say that all the time. I think it's important to give back and mm. um, you know that's why you give of your time um, to do it. Yeah. Um, I can't say it's been easy. Yes. Uh, it's it's oh, you can't do both. So um, mm. you know, for the three years, it's really been mm. being president. And even because you know, somebody said Jake mm -hmm. Harvey said to me the other day in in uh, the Bill Scott retrospective, he said, "Oh, you'll have got a lot more work done while you've been off." And I said, "I'm afraid not. You've got more work to do because it's online all the time. Mm -hmm. The business doesn't stop. Yeah. But you're not. I mean, what you don't have is." You don't have some of the perks, you know, which are going to dinners and things like that, mm -hmm. which are always, and, and, you know, not being able to meet people mm -hmm. which are of, of advantage mm -hmm. to the academy. Mm -hmm. I think that's been a big mm -hmm. drawback. Mm -hmm. It's unfortunate that probably nearly two thirds of my presidency has been sitting in, in the office at home <laughs> on, on the computer. <laughs> it's it's yeah. not easy. Yeah. Do you still have to wear, I always remember Robin Phillipson and the others in those, Renaissance inspired velvet robes and berries and gold chains. Of office. Yes, Do you still yes, have? we we wear them for the opening. The council mm. wears them for the opening of the RSA, and when um. we go on the parades at St Giles, mm. unfortunately, they've been left in the president's room over the thing. You know, because we'd had them when before we were shut down for that mm. annual exhibition in twenty twenty twenty. Yes, <laughs> and the moths have been at them. <laughs> <laughs> but then I mean, a lot of people say, well, the moths were always there, you know. <laughs> um, oh dear. I was going to ask you about, we talked on it a little bit, about your uh, practice in painting. Mm -hmm. You've always, you've shown me, and we will look at some later in, your, in one of your other studios, um, done lots of little sketch drawings and ideas mm -hmm. which you worked your ideas through. Can you... Uh, explain what your procedure is? Well, often they start with a doodle, you know. I mean, mm. I, we used to be very creative in the meetings that used to have in, in Grey School of Art, you know. Mm. You get bored and you just sit, mm. well, I think we've always doodled. And you look, if you look around in these meetings, everybody's doodling. Mm. And that would be, you know, because your mind's sort of emptied, you mm. can sort of, things, surprising things come mm. out. Um, but often, you know, these doodles, you know, then I develop them a bit further, but sometimes the ideas take three years mm -hmm. before they will come mm -hmm. to fruition. Mm -hmm. And um, they go through various processes uh, uh, where I go over them again and draw them again. I use tracing paper and I'll mm -hmm. um, recreate them, move images about, mm -hmm. and then I'll square them up and then transfer them onto mm -hmm. the board. Which is very traditional. And also... Yeah. You said you always uh, work on board, not canvas. Yes, I've never liked canvas. I, I, it's too bouncy. Yeah. yeah. Neither did Joan Eardley either. Yeah. She yeah. Didn't like it. No, I mean, I, because I, I, I think I was saying earlier, I used to do my life paintings on canvas at Grey's, mm. and everybody, you know, people say at the Royal College said, "Why are your life paintings so different from your other paintings?" Mm. <laughs> but you felt that because it was a life painting, mm. it had to be special. Mm. It had to be well. You were encouraged to mm. use it. But no, I mean, what I do is the drawings that don't, they're, they're quite complicated, but they don't mm. have all the stuff in them that eventually happens. There's still a lot of creativity once they're squared up. Mm. Really, when working on that scale and, and given the complexity mm. of the nature and, um, you know, the kind of geometry of mm. it, you know, you have to plan mm. it on that small scale mm. to get it to work. Mm. I couldn't just start in a corner. Um, I've done that mm. on a few occasions with something like the big shoe painting I did for War Tourists with the shoes mm. from Mag Maginac, um, because you were just expanding out from it. Mm. And the same with another painting, which was um, uh, bat the battlefield, mm. the First World Battlefield, where I started mm. with different artefacts that just spread out mm. and spread yeah. out. But there was still a little drawing for that of where there might have been a big wheel mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. where you know might be in a trench or two mm -hmm. but something like that painting behind us you couldn't just start and hope it would work yeah and it's very it traditional it you're yes. right but it doesn't mean to say that there's not a lot to happen I don't mm -hmm. do color studies really I just mm -hmm. you know I have a kind of idea in my head also your actual surface of your paintings is very like tempera it is no, it's layers and layers of acrylic primer yeah. goes on it, and 
Um, sometimes, you know, you'll see the brush strokes of yeah. that, you know, just adds a little bit of something to it. Do you always only work in acrylic or...? No, I don't work in... Or, or for primer. Yes, the yes. yes. Uh, no, I work the primer. Oh, so yeah, so that the gives preparation the white ground. Work. Yeah, white and ground, which is acrylic. And thinly painted oil. In and it's oil, yeah. Yeah, always or, oil. But painted in, in, in layers as well? Or? No, it's, I work in a kind of transparent way, you know, yes, and gradually yeah. build up. And I... You know, I'm not somebody who uses heavy paint because no, it's more like a watercolour. Yes, it's and shimmering. Because, and your, yeah, and also because I'm, it's all about the drawing all the time. If you notice, mm. I, I mm. reinforce it with mm. lines here, mm. there, and they give the direction. Mm. Sometimes in the early paintings, the lines were kind of wounds, mm. um, you know, give on the painting, mm -hmm. and to create kind of unease, etc. Mm. But I'm constantly, I suppose, mm. like Cowie, though not as wonderful as Cowie, is all mm. about the drawing and the mm. line, um, mm. and it's a very northeast thing. Yes, of I course. think and it how is. And taught at hospital. Yes, field, didn't I mean, he? Uh, I mean, I've never been into sort of Bill, Bill tour. You know, mm. I've always been in that northern kind of uh, mm. Grunwald or, or mm. Beckman. The line mm. so important in Beckman and Gross, mm. Mm. and that's where my history is. Well, that's another question I was going yeah. to ask you: What artists influenced you, and what your touchstone artworks? So many, um, you, you know, I had to write something, who's your favourite Scottish painter for the, um, Fleming's Wyfold? Mm. I thought, wow, <laughs> so many. Mm. Yeah. Um, you know, when I was younger, I suppose, um, I'm very keen on flat, you know, Byzantine, mm. uh, medieval mm. paintings, pre-Italian, mm. um, Renaissance That's paintings, cool. and a lot of the stuff that I would have up in my studio piece would be, you know, Paintings mm. of Duccio or Kebabui mm. or that sort of thing, mm. and um, when also when I went to London, then it added the Paraphilites. Mm. You know, I, I hadn't seen them in Scotland really much. So you, you know, mm. uh, and and I must Will, say you're Will, looking around the Paraphilite yeah, yourself now. Yeah, and <laughs> William Blake. You know, I loved yeah, William Blake. Oh, um, he was another hero. And funnily enough, in Edinburgh, one of my favourite paintings in when it was in the modern art was in Inverleith was uh, Sidney Nolan of Lee Dunn the Swan. Do you remember that painting? I do. I was at my favourite It was a wonderful painting. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, I don't... He was like, a very uneven painter. Sidney very. Nolan. Yes, I was going to say, <laughs> there are not many, mm. but the Lee Dunn and the Swan yeah. series, mm -hmm. to me, were quite magical, mm. um, I thought. And along as a way early on, these mm. Phillipsons. And, you know, yeah. and then looking late, because I had to write this for Weming Wyfold, I took one of the, um, Phillipsons war paintings, which she'd done, almost like, I suppose, a Jas uh, Rauschenberg, where it was mm. in bands, and it's mm. in, a, in the um, Academy collection. Mm. So I wrote about that, and it was quite interesting to read about, you know, this kind of mm -hmm. time in the war. I mean, some of Philipson's, um, I, I never really quite liked the Fighting Cockerel mm. series. Um, oh, I quite liked those. Yeah, but and, <laughs> I, and, I mean, when Ventura. I was very young, That's I loved those I mean. rose windows, you know, yes. and I even tried to simulate it once by yeah. sticking a plastic doily on the surface and covering <laughs> it. Right. But you move on. But mm. I mean, I still think he was a remarkable colourist. Mm -hmm. A remarkable yes. facility. Mm -hmm. um, I called him a confectioner once in an article yes. and he wasn't pleased by that. Well, I'm sure he wouldn't be, but no, I mean, he, you know, to mm. have that facility is, yeah. is wonderful and the watercolours yes. and things. So, yeah, but, you know, obviously Bonnard, Villard, all the usual suspects. Yeah. Kokoschka, well, I was a huge fan of Kokoschka in my third year. As was Philipson. Yeah, as was Philipson. I didn't know that then. Mm. And I remember Philipson writing, went to see Kokoschka. Oh, he did he? Me, yes. All right. Okay. And brought him a bunch of flowers. Yeah. Well, I, <laughs> I wrote an essay on Kokoschka called Bewitched, Bothered and Bewildered from that song yeah. because uh, people couldn't understand why I liked Kokoschka and I was really pissed off because I thought he was a wonderful artist. Yes, okay. well, you remember when he did that portrait of the Duke and Duchess of Hamilton, the Duke said, well, it's all very well, but why have you given me a green face? <laughs> But <laughs> just, isn't that just typical, isn't it? So, yeah. so but, many, you know, all artists have, you know, we're mm -hmm. all mongrels. We just take mm -hmm. it from everywhere. But for you, apart from technique and that practice, for you, really important has always been narrative. 
always telling a story. Yes. All your paintings have yes, got a story. all of them. Even yeah. it's just simple head with a cat, there's always yeah, a story. There's always a story. Even, and I mean, even in those early kind of Byzantine things, you know, mm. there was a kind of mythology period I mm. went through for legends mm. and all sorts mm -hmm. of things. And at one point, I even wrote poems in the paintings, yeah. which are so embarrassing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I could imagine. Yeah. But in the narrative painting and telling a story has always been central to your work. Mm -hmm. But I think your greatest achievement, and I think you would agree yourself, has been your war tourist series, which mm. we have uh, one here. Um, what is this one called? Um, it's called Cherami and Martin Puch. And I've, I showed you a drawing. And at that time, I hadn't really known what the title mm. was or how it was going to work out. But when mm. I was doing, because I do a lot of research, Mm. And I always wanted to do a map of the Western Front at a certain time. So that's the, the map mm. of how the lines were in 1917. Mm. But I found, I was looking at animals in wartime, and mm. I found this story about this um, a pigeon called Cherami. Oh, and this okay. pigeon, um, he's got no, he's got a leg missing, and he saved a whole Italian um, battalion from extinction by managing to fly back even though he'd been wounded by shrapnel flying back because they didn't know where it was an american lot they didn't know where they were and so he saved all their lives so this cher ami he, he did kind of keep going for a, a few years but when he died he was um, stuffed and yeah. he's in the smithsonian mm -hmm. museum in washington mm -hmm. um so that's that's cher ami there and martin puch was a cat which um, was a pet of the Gordon Highlanders on the Somme mm. and he um, it was called Martin de Pouch because that's where they were um, you know on the lines at that point mm. I think it was overrun by Germans and they got it back again you know mm. you know how things came mm. and went in mm. the war and um, on the table all these artifacts are placed you know like this on, at Cambrai there's a little sugar um, it's a chocolate tank so you know, I got you know, mm. I collect images of things from all over. So you'll find different things that you know, like there's the the chocolate helmets which you can buy in Ypres. Mm. So that's up there, and then gas mm. attack up uh, different bits. So really, it was to try and again bring um, what people would have recognised at that time, mm. things they used um, into the into mm. the picture. And Suicide Corner was one of the, the names, and you know, all of the trenches mm, had names, mm, and that just mm. happened to take that one for a reason. Mm. So you've got the Highland Division in there, you've got a little French chap, and um, and there also the, the pigeon with the message strapped onto his back. You've mm. got the, the kind of German, mm -hmm. uh, well, German mm. thing. Lusitania has all went down, of course, at yes. the, in that time. Mm. Um, a kind of American mm. thing. And, and you insert yourself into them as a almost a time traveller. Yes, yes, mm. yes. I do that, um, you know, because it's me who's telling the story. Mm. And certainly in my father's, uh, my father's not in this one because obviously the First World War, mm. but I always, the, the time traveller always has a locket round her neck with her father's picture in. And it's like he's taking me on a tour mm. of the battlefield. There was one which was mm. the... Um, Longstop Hill, which mm. had me on a camel with him directing mm. me through mm. Duga and all mm. the things that were happening mm. up in the hills beyond Tunis. Because I've travelled to all these places. Yes, yeah, that should explain that. How did the War Tourist Series come about? It, it came about because of the suitcase. I think I mentioned yes, that earlier. Mm. And I suddenly, and, and also way back in the um, now, which one was it? Yes, that big 84 exhibition. Yeah. I'd been in Rennes and there were liberation ceremonies going on. It had never occurred to me to think about it. And I thought, of course, my father thought in the war. He would have, you know, if he'd been alive, could have been part of this. Not that he was in that area. Mm -hmm. And um, so I came back and, and did that uh, big brown painting of um, a figure, you know, which was me, but was France, you know, mm. being swamped by mm. all sorts of things mm. but then I didn't really do anything much about it for a couple of years then I started going to war museums and um, going on any kind of um, naval boats that came in the yes. harbour mm. um, um, so 
so things came in, but not possibly in a researched way. You know, there would just be characters that filled mm. in the paintings, with, mm. you know, filled in or became part of the life in Fitty, mm -hmm. the parties that went on in Fitty. Uh, they just became part mm. of that backdrop. Um, and then, obviously, once I it was more to my father, then I started doing more research. And I went up to Fort George, and, of course, he's mentioned in all sorts of the, the, the his... Um, the Highland divisions up there, and um, you know, gradually just reading everything about everything I could, mm. and so the paintings emerged from that. Yeah. But at the same time, over I was how interested... long a period of time? Ah, oh, um, that many? exhibition was like twelve years' work. Right. You know, it yeah. started, and sometimes I'd show them, and then I took time off to do more of them, and it it just evolved. I probably took on too much because having been up. When I'd been in Germany, you know, I'd gone up to Bremen, which is where my father ended up in Bremen, mm. and he would have probably have gone to Belsen, which was just mm. down the road, and I'd visited Belsen on that trip, and um, I, it, I then I thought, right, I really ought to go to Poland, though that was nothing to mm. do with my father. Mm. So I went on these organised mm. tours because mm. they took you to all sorts of places, and so I ended up going to Poland and going to Auschwitz mm -hmm. and Maginac and various other, you know, terrible places, mm. terrible places. And do you, was the whole thing cathartic for you, do you think, painting these? Yes, I think it was. I think it was. I, I feel... But it's quite a, a, an endeavour to do it. It was a huge... Mm. Uh, yes, it was. Mm. And I have so much material. Mm. I've got mm. books and books mm -hmm. of photographs from Tunisia, mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. Europe. Mm -hmm. um, and... Probably, you know, I, 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 mm. you can't use them all, but mm. you take what you can. Well, and I, some things will just, yeah. click, you know, click with you, like the, there's a big painting just of poppies. Mm. And that came about by uh, a picture in the Times of a guy m making poppies, and he was just in a sea of poppies. Mm -hmm. And I thought, right, it maybe seems a bit predictable, but then I just did a big mm. wall of poppies with First World War artefacts embedded in the poppies. And uh, then, of course, that painting that was in your show was in Flanders Field mm -hmm. from Lieutenant John McRae, you know, mm -hmm. when I took his poem and, you know, with his gravestone and mm -hmm. two other mm -hmm. graves, the first soldier to die in the First War, World mm -hmm. War and the last one to die. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I think they're a great achievement, those, those pictures are uh -huh. fantastic paintings. Yeah. Well, it's important to me to it's important for me to do pictures that have a kind of meaning mm -hmm. in them, whether people mm -hmm. like them or not. You know, mm -hmm. is is irrelevant. Mm -hmm. uh, Can we come back to Scotland again for a minute? You mentioned Fitty, with enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. It's where you had your house and studio in, uh, at the foot of the River Dee in Aberdeen, sticking out into the yeah. North Sea. I remember visiting you there and being as cold as I've ever been in my life <laughs> one February. You haven't uh, swum uh, in the sea there. <laughs> <laughs> but um, that was a great inspiration on your that, work I as moved well. there in 79 and I just I, I saw the house for sale when I was out on a drawing trip with mm. some of the first year students and I was with Ian Howard. I said, oh God, Ian, that, look at that amazing house on a corner. It was painted purple woodwork. It was very mm. funereal, mm. but, but it probably the, it was the last shop in Fitty and I think he'd got the paint cheap. <laughs> <laughs> it was dark purple. And, um, oh, you moved body and soul to get that house. And I lived in that particular house until 2012. So about 35 years I was in there. Mm. And then I have another house, I have another mm. house in the village. Mm. So I still have my home in, home in the village. Mm. Um, but it's, it, yes, initially when I moved there, it was probably more the weather, the sea, you know, the water being surrounded mm. with water and through yeah, the sides. I remember, maybe I'm in, I'm, uh, it's a false memory, but I seem to remember the waves hitting the back of the house and coming over the roof. No, no, they wouldn't have there. No, 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 no. Goodness <laughs> me, would have been drowned. We're right. Because, we, I mean, I had boat, I had oil boats berthed berth at the bottom of my lane. They were yes. just a stone throw, you know, just through the mud cement tacks. And, and also, um, Britannia was berthed mm. in there one time. That was mm. hugely exciting because mm. you had all the armed forces in every category there and yes uh, and you seem to like a man in uniform well I, oh, yes i know well it was a weakness at one point <laughs> until i found one <laughs> and uh, uh, and in fact you include lots of 
uh, naval things in your paintings as well? Well, I did, right? yes. And of course, then I met a guy who'd been in the Fleet Air Arm, so mm. that had, a, had an effect. But no, I was <laughs> just interested in, I don't know, it just seemed to be exciting for me. It's, I was at a difficult age, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but no, the house, initially the, the paintings were actually more abstract. I don't know if you remember that a lot of these paintings, early paintings, were in the Compass Show, whereby they were more to do with um, the harbour paraphernalia, mm -hmm. and perhaps it was the influence of Arthur mm -hmm. Watson at that mm -hmm. time that yes. filled the work. So for a year I, I followed that route, and there was obviously mm -hmm. sometimes the you figure You were married elephants. to Arthur then? Yes, okay. yes. Well, no, did I? Yes, I yeah. married him. Yes, I did. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I can remember whether I did or I didn't. <laughs> yes, well, I wasn't invited to the wedding. But, <laughs> well, but, we didn't have one. Yeah. It was just a registry office. Yes. I'd done one wedding before that, so I wasn't having another one. Oh, was this your third? No, you know, he was my second. Oh, I didn't realise yeah, that. So, oh, and then I'm on my third at the minute. Yeah, yes. yeah. <laughs> Very impressive. I, I think on that note, before we get into anything too complicated, right. we might end with one final question. If you had to give advice to a young female artist just starting out today, what would you say to her? Oh, I think, we, I think that female artists today have it much, much better than we had then. And I think you've got to, um, I think people have changed in the art schools. People are much more understanding that mm -hmm. you, you, you know, that you can't treat people the way that they used to. Um, and and I, I would have to say that the majority of prizes that are awarded in the academy, not by any chance for manipulation, seem to be go to um, young female artists. Uh, it, we've done that. I've done a bit of research mm. on that, and it, it's extraordinary that mm. more females have had the Kinross mm. scholarships than men. Mm. Um, but I'm not out and about, and I don't know how it is uh, for young people today. Mm. Really, I know that we promote young people in the RSC, and that's the most important thing that we do. Mm and that um, equal opportunities is absolutely at the top and that, you know, we, we go for the, um, it's the strength of the work, the, the, the quality of the work and nothing else that's important when we judge this. Would it have been easier for you in your life had you been a man, do you think? If I'd been what? A man. Earlier on, do you know, Andrew, I don't probably think so. You see, mm. when I was young, yes, you got jealousy, uh, but it never held me back. Mm. I mean, I did everything. I, I mean, it, I mean, perhaps if I'd been a, a man, I might have become a professor in the art school. Mm. I don't know. Mm. Um, but at the other end of the thing, I never wanted to take high office and look mm. at me now <laughs> because it would have interfered with my work. Mm. I was re really happy. The thing that I loved most of all was teaching the students mm. and trying to um, introduce them to the mm. world that I loved so much and encourage them. And I think I did do that. Um, I've never met, I think very rarely met an art student that I didn't get on with. You can go anywhere mm. in the world and you go into an art school and you immediately have and can have a conversation and an affinity and an understanding. Mm. You don't have to explain yourself. Mm. Um, I think art students are wonderful. I really do. And I wish all, f I, I would, I probably would have to speak to female students today to see how it was for them. A, a really a final question. Do you think being a woman, living a female body with a woman's experiences of life actually affects your painting. I mean, is there a feminine aesthetic different from a man's? Oh, again, that's, you know, I think, I think as a female artist, I don't want to think like that. I'm mm. just the same as a man, I think. We, we probably, but I think you're probably right, yes. I, the, you can't um, I think separate I'll, your lived experience. No, you can't. Um, it's feminine in, in the thing that I, I tend to use, you know, mainly a lot of female people in my pictures. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, someone like Adrian Wisniewski mm -hmm. paints 
you know, his kind of image of, you know, young, young men, lads yeah. and whatnot. And he, re he sometimes puts women in, and I, I sometimes put men mm. in, but it's just because it's coming from your experience. Mm. So therefore, it's going to come, be in your, um, in, mm. you know, be mm. you. Mm. I mean, you're your own model, really. Mm. You know your face so well, you can distort it, you can do anything you like with it. Mm. And because it's a narrative, you're you're talking about your own life experiences, mm. and so therefore, for a man, it's probably the same thing. But it's because they inhabit a you know um, their male persona. Mm. That's that's I don't see it. I don't paint it because I'm a woman. I just paint them because I paint them. It's never really bothered me that I, I don't think that's probably not a clever answer. But I can't think. No, I think it's an honest answer, and, and it is that you know. I, I suspect, as other people have said, when you paint, you're just a painter. You're That's neither right. a man or a woman. Yeah. And you're either a good or a bad yeah. painter. Yeah. And in my opinion, you are a very, very yeah. good painter. And can I just say one other thing? In that, you know, in the academy, you, you know, the age, you know, we go from kind of young academicians mm. right up to our oldest, who's Francis. Mm. Which, oh, she quite, no, she's not quite the oldest. There's one or two others. Mm. But uh, we go up mm. to people in their 90s. Mm. We never think of age. It's the same. I never think of, a, of you know, mm. separate men and women. They're just other artists. Mm. And I think that's the other wonderful thing, that artists go on forever. And that, you know, mm. we, 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 can, we, we can talk about anything, you know. And it, we, it's a shared experience and it doesn't matter what age you are when you, you talk to one another. Mm. Whereas in the other walks of life, mm. it does matter. And it doesn't, and I think that's what's great, that we can all sit down and have a laugh and have a party, no matter what age that we are. We and don't get better the go older into you ages get. cliques. Yeah, yeah. So to me, that's excellent. That's what I like about the Academy, that there is no ageism. And now um, it, the whole thing, it, the, the, that kind of, kind of masculine element that was there when I was elected, mm. there, you know, there was hardly any women. Mm. And when I... Uh, went to the varnishing day lunch that was just amazing because it was a sea of male faces, mm. jovial male faces, mm. all having a great time. Mm. And when I made my little acceptance speech, mm. <laughs> they pelted me with flowers from the vases. <laughs> it was such an unusual occurrence mm. to have a female mm. who was mm. elected to the mm. academy. But it's different now. Mm. You can't, we, we, you, you know, we are having to play catch up, but mm. you know, you, you can only do it. Mm -hmm. um, as much as you can, and you, you can't manipulate that. Mm -hmm. It still all yeah. depends on how good you are. Joyce, it's been lovely talking to you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>